Hello, good evening and welcome to News 360. It is coming to you live from our news hub here at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. I am Aisha Yakubu. And my name is Park Yasare. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, we've got a compilation of local plus international stories. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, Piccadilly Biscuits and My Life Insurance. Attention at University of Education uh, of Winneba, High Court restrains Professor Afrobroni from holding himself as Vice Chancellor of the University. Also, shops belonging to foreign traders at Oprah Square in Accra shot following fracas between them and some Ghanaian retailers. Illegal miners invade Kweu Obo and Eta environs after being chased out of western and central regions by government's tax force on illegal mining. We've got the very latest details of all these and many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Even in business, the governor of the central bank says Ghana will not be forced to use the echo currency. And on the international front, Boris Johnson wins Tory leadership, becoming next Prime Minister of United Kingdom. We've got the very latest details of all these stories, plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Be reminded that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with the views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. We're very active on social media. Our handle is TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, let's begin. There is an easy calm at Opera Square as some Ghanaian traders have begun closing down shops of foreign traders. According to them, they are only enforcing the laws which stops foreigners from engaging in retail business. Here's a report by Harry Mensah and Adam Tutu. Ghanaian traders at Opera Square are closing down shops of foreign traders. Over 20 shops have been closed down by these aggrieved Ghanaian traders. Some disclosed they are enforcing the law with or without the authorities' approval. Some victims expressed they have the right to trade as the shops belong to Ghanaians. She's a Ghanaian, full Ghanaian, and the shop is owned by my wife, not me. I have married her for over 15 years. My wife came and he met with the chairman of the association. And the chairman told her that she should go to court. Then we don't understand what he means by court. As a Ghanaian, does it, did she not have a full light to operate in the market? The situation was, however, calm when the police, together with some heads of the Ghana Police Service, met the aggrieved customers and entreated them to allow law enforcement agencies handle the situation. <laughs> Now, the minority in parliament is unhappy with chairman of the Trade and Industry Committee, Nana Amenian Pomafo, over the snail pace of investigations into Guta and foreign national trade conflicts. Deputy ranking member of the committee, Yusuf Suleimana, is calling on the majority leader to call him to order. His comment follow another clash at the Oprah Square Market within the Central Business District of Accra Monday afternoon as Ghanaian traders locked up shops owned by foreign nationals. It is the second time such incident had occurred at the Oprah Square where Ghanaian traders, particularly members of the Ghana Electrical Dealers Association, had locked up foreign-owned shops operating within the square. The retailers took this action to get the government to enforce the law that reserves retail trade for locals. Reacting to the matter, Deputy Ranking Member of Parliament's Trade and Industry Committee, Yusuf Suleimana, blamed the chairman of the committee, Nana Aminiam Pomafu, for the clashes. I think that the committee uh, leadership, I'm part of it, but I think that the chairman is not helping us. And I am making this announcement to the majority leader 
to call the leadership on his side to book because they are not helping us at the community levels. Two months ago, there was a similar confusion in Swami magazine in Kumasi leading to the shops of some Nigerian traders being ransacked with threat of further violence. The issue was brought before parliament and referred to the committee. Some stakeholders were engaged but no conclusion was arrived at. This, Yusuf Silimana stressed, is worrying. We met with um, all the stakeholders, the Minister of uh, Trade, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, the Minister of, uh, I mean the GIPC. We met all of them, even including Immigration Service. And they all agreed that they were supposed to give us some papers. Now they presented the papers and we went on to interrogate the papers and ask questions. So at the end of the day, we are able to arrive at something conclusive. According to Section 27.1 of the GIPC Act, a person who is not a citizen or an enterprise which is not wholly owned by a citizen shall not invest or participate in the sale of goods or provision of services in a market, petty trading or hawking or selling of goods in a store at any place. The deputy ranking member is convinced it was an opportunity for parliament to take a second look at the law that bars foreigners from engaging in retail business. There's a law that we all are not comfortable with, either in terms of how it is framed or in terms of its implementation. And it is only this house that can do something about it. The majority chief whip, Matthew Nyendam, is also of the view the law must be reviewed to remove all barriers that affect free trade amongst West African states. If you have laws in this country that are restricting foreigners from doing that kind of retail in the leg work, we have to look at the laws, especially now that we are coming to host African free trade secretariats in, in Ghana here. What will be the implication on that law? Meanwhile, executives of the Ghana Union Traders Association, Guta, say such forceful action is not the best approach to deal with the problem, urging members attacking foreigners to exercise restraint. Now let's move away from matters of trade and take a quick trip to the eastern region where some illegal miners have invaded Kweu and its environs uh, after they were chased out of the western and central regions by government tax force on illegal mining. Some excavators and small-scale mining equipment have been assembled in the area. The Jasehine of Ubo Kweu Nana Dr. Okrabedu III says the activities by some of these miners is a worry to them. Some illegal miners have invaded Kwehu and its environs in the eastern region after they were chased out of the western and central regions by government tax force on illegal mining. Some excavators and small-scale mining equipment have been assembled in the area. It is alleged that some Ghanaians and Chinese nationals have invaded some areas in Kuhu and its environs and are destroying water bodies and several hectares of farmlands. The Jasehine of Obo Kuhu, Nana Dr. Okrab Badu III, explained that the illegal miners are currently embarking on brisk mining activities in the rivers in the Kuhu enclave. He said about a month ago they heard these illegal miners have migrated to the Kuhu enclaves so they started investigating by visiting some of the mining sites. Look at it. This is, a, this is the cocoa trees and this is the garamsey. Obviously they have destroyed a number of areas. Nana accused the Lands and Minerals Commission of not helping the fight against illegal mining since they give permits without inspecting what they use the permit for. The chief said the matter was reported to the Nkoko Divisional Police for Protection to be able to stop the illegal mining, but the police failed to provide them with personnel. Nana added that the police commander informed them that it is the duty of the Operation Vanguard to provide protection in the fight against illegal mining. He, however, promised to fight illegal mining due to the negative effect. Now, David Asante appeared to may have been asked to proceed on leave as IGP, but one conversation that will go on for a while will be how well he performed during his tenure. The following news desk report highlights key developments during the period he served as the senior most police officer. My interest, in the interest of my party, and I believe that is the interest of the people of Ghana, 
is that we have a police service, and indeed a security service, which is professional. President Tekufuado expressing strong support and confidence in David Asantia Pietu when he named him acting IGP in January 2017. Two months later, the former CID Director General would be confirmed as IGP. One of the first major challenges he had to deal with was the lawless conduct of MPP vigilante group members who went on rampage seizing toll booths and public toilets across the country. Many security analysts describe this as his first test. How he would handle this would determine how well posterity would judge him. Some arrests were effected. The Amasaman Divisional Police Command, for example, arrested the constituency chairman for Trobu Kwame J for attempting to take over activities at the Doblo toll booth. Generally, Asantia Pietu's administration was criticized for handling the situation poorly. The vigilante situation will rear its ugly head again later in 2017. Delta Force members would invade the offices of the Ashanti Regional Security Coordinator, George J, and forcibly remove him. Some of the attacks were arrested. In a rather daring move, their other counterparts stormed a court in the region trying them and forcibly freed them. This would again go against the record of the then IGP. Later on in his tenure, robbery cases, particularly in the national capital, would put his competence under scrutiny. This is what eventually led to the introduction of Operation Calm Life, a collaboration between the police and the military to help curb the situation. Security experts commended the police hierarchy for this move as the situation improved somewhat. Few would easily forget the disturbances and events that unfolded during the Ayawaso West Wagon by election. When he appeared before the Emil Short Commission, he admitted that the collaboration between the security agencies could be better. The videos we saw, DSP Azugu was actually trying to part a fight instead of ordering that the operative should cease. It means he had no control. Yes, my lord. I mean, this uh, commission has brought to fore so many things, so many lessons that we are learning. Speaking at a separate forum, the former IGP appealed to political parties to disband their vigilante groups. We want to appeal to all political parties to immediately denounce their own vigilante groups. To create the necessary awareness that will embolden the police. Recently, David Asantia Pietu was in the news following the police's refusal to grant bail to Gregory Afoko despite a court order. The decision by his former executive secretary, Peter Tobu, to contest as an NDC parliamentary candidate also became a subject of controversy. Some known social media activists of the governing party called for his sack. It is not clear if these developments contributed to the president's decision to ask him to proceed on leave. But his tenure, like his predecessors, will continue to be scrutinized by experts and the general public. If you just tuned in, a reminder, you're watching News 360 live from our news hub here at Adesawe in Kanda, Accra. Let's now focus on some hardcore politics and the National Democratic uh, Congress parliamentary primaries is some four weeks away. But already the two leading aspirants in the Denton constituency have locked horns over who is more qualified to be elected as parliamentary candidates on the ticket of the NDC. My colleague Kwacha Frenyama has been spending some time at the constituency and comes through with this report. Talk about a swing constituency and Adentan comes to mind. Since it was carved out of the Ashaman constituency in 2004, the two major political parties have each won elections here on two occasions. The MPP first won the 2004 election and also the 2016 parliamentary polls. The NDC also won the 2008 and 2012 parliamentary elections here in the Adentan constituency. The constituency is made up of areas like Boche, Adenta, Ashie and Amanfrom. It is mainly inhabited by middle class citizens. 
one of the major challenges in the constituency is poor road network, particularly in communities like Boche. The increasing spate of armed robbery is also a concern to many constituents. After holding on to the seat for eight years, the MPP snagged the seat from the NDC in the 2016 polls. This would continue a trend that has seen no sitting MP in Adentan stay in office for more than one term. The MPP's candidate and incumbent MP, Yabwabian Samoa, polled some 33,952 votes, representing 50.64% to defeat the NDC's Mohamed Adamu Ramadan, who polled 48.61%, representing some 32,000 588 votes. Without a doubt, the NDC wants the seat back badly. At the close of nominations on Friday, July 12, three persons, former gender minister Nanoye Letha, 2016 candidate Mohamed Adamu Ramadan, and former Adentan MCE Benjamin Angenu had picked forms to contest. However, Benjamin Angenu did not file his nominations when the deadline elapsed on July 19. It is now a straight fight between Mohamed Ramadan and Nana Oyelitha. In politics, as in football, the job they say is on the ground. But one of the most difficult aspects of politics is convincing delegates to vote for you. The various aspirants have been meeting with delegates. We have to win 20. And the relevance and importance of voting something that we cannot overemphasize. Nanoye Letha says she's the best person for the job. I am the trusted candidate who can win the seat for NDC in Adenta. I'm a unifier. I'm the Ya Santua. I'm tried and tested. Questions have been asked about her involvement in the activities of the NDC in the Adentan constituency over the years. But Nanoye Letha says that can never be in doubt. I have uh, supported the party at the constituency level in various ways, um, especially when Honorable um, Ashimo was the member of parliament for Adenta. Mohamed Ramadan, however, insists she is not known in the constituency. Her involvement in our constituency is not much, so I'm sure the delegates would, would see through the lines. This is a, a parliamentary election. It's, it's concentrated here in the constituency and... She hasn't been very active with us. The 2016 parliamentary candidate says he's seeking a comeback, having learned from his mistakes. I'm going back in there to redeem myself, to redeem my image, and then to win the seat back for the party in the 2020 general elections. One man who has contested in the parliamentary primaries here before is the current NDC constituency chairman, Alaji Baba Zakaria. I asked him what caliber of person the party expects to emerge as candidates after the polls. Floating voters are the people that matters. So it is a person that who the floating voters would also be looking at. So these are the potential voters, I mean the candidates. When you pick this in the party core members, the number will be there. But we need people who also dear to their floating voters. The two contenders remain confident of victory going into the primaries on August 24, but indeed the thumb of delegates and the outcome of the polls will decide who represents the NDC going into the crucial election of 2020. For TV3 News, Kwache Afreniama, Adentan Constituency. On our MTN video report this evening, our citizen journalist Emmanuel Odonko reports on a malfunctioning traffic light at Lati Junction in the Greater Accra region. The traffic light is not working. It's not been working for three to four months. And it places pedestrians at a risk because the vehicles are in a hurry to drive past the traffic light area and I don't know if they are waiting for an accident before they come fix it. This is so so disheartening. 
those coming from the 37 directions are in a hurry to cross towards the Teshi road those also coming from the Osu direction are in a hurry to turn towards the 37 road and you know where the intersection is there's chaos there there's always chaos there if the drivers were even patient enough it would have been smooth in uh, to, to some extent but everyone is in a hurry to go you can see vehicles coming at top speed and a taxi driver is trying to find his way through this is so bad You can also send your video report via WhatsApp number 0551 Right, you're still watching News 360 here on TV3. Still ahead in the bulletin. In business, Governor of the Central Bank says Ghana will not be forced to use the echo currency. And on the international front, Sir Boris Johnson, uh, Johnson went Tory leadership becoming next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Stay with us here. There's more news after this break. Hello out there, good evening and welcome to the business news segment here on News 360. To begin with, Governor of the Central Bank, Ernest Addison, says Ghana will not be forced to use the echo currency unless it is fully convinced of its benefits. The currency was adopted by the authority of ECOWAS heads of state and government this month in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Beginning January 2020, countries within the West African sub-region will be able to use a single currency called ECO after its adoption by the authority of ECOWAS heads of state and government earlier in Abuja. The West African leaders endorsed the currency at their 55th ordinary session and approved a roadmap towards the currency's issuance in January 2020. There was a roadmap to ensure that all member countries meet three primary criteria for the adoption of the currency. That includes member countries having a budget deficit of not more than 3%, average annual inflation of less than 10%, with a long-term goal of not more than 5% by 2019. Countries were expected to also have gross reserves that can finance at least three months of imports. The other convergence criteria that have been adopted by ECOWAS are public debt or gross domestic product of not more than 70%. There's also the issue of central banks financing budget deficit, not more than 10% of previous year's tax revenue and nominal exchange rates variation of plus or minus 10%. Reacting to the latest development, Dr. Ernest Addison said a lot of consideration will have to go into Ghana deciding to use the currency. In practical terms, if two small countries, for example, meet that criteria, what will that common currency do? So there are very practical issues why that does not look feasible to me. Right. So we, we hope that we would need, uh, if we see a critical mass of countries, and those countries that matter, those countries with significant weight in the GDPs, for example, if they meet the criteria and they are able to join, then you can see that you would have a viable common currency arrangement that has been put into place. So I think it's too early to draw any conclusions. At the end of the Abuja meeting, a communique read by Nigeria's Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mustafa Suleiman, noted that the regional leaders instructed the ECOWAS Commission to work in collaboration with West African Monetary Agency. The Commission is also expected to work with West African Monetary Institute and all central banks on a symbol for the single currency. All right, so we we'll wait and see what happens. 
And staying on the financial sector, a financial analyst and director of strategy and business operations at Dalex Finance, Joe Jackson, has observed the financial sector cleanup has led to liquidity challenges which could result in collapse of some institutions that survive the exercise. He indicated the need for the central bank to release money to the consolidated bank Ghana and affected customers. country's banking sector cleanup has seen the number of commercial banks dropped from 33 to 23. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, has stated the cleanup is yielding results. Banks' total assets amounted to 112.8 billion Ghana CDs. The increase in total assets was funded mainly from deposits. Executive Director of Ghana Microfinance Institutions Network Yao Jenfi is of the view it will take a little longer for the benefit to be realized. With the projections that we've done, we anticipate that the next four or five years we'll have a very strong financial system if we don't relax on our duties. The cleanup of the financial sector led to panic withdrawals. The minimum 10% liquidity buffer was stretched as customers demanded funds, but deposits continued to decline, negatively affecting liquidity requirements of the banks. This, according to a financial analyst, Joe Jackson, has led to demand outpacing money supply. Everybody who had money with other local institutions started getting worried that, wow, is our money safe? And so, started pulling out their money. There was a death of money in all these institutions because, simply, people felt that my money would be safer with me. Managing Director of CDH Savings and Loans, Martin Asamoa, has noted the situation is worrying, adding a lot more financial institutions could collapse due to liquidity challenges facing the sector. The public, they have some confidence in the regulator. So if they come out and give a message out there that yes, you are behind these institutions, we are giving them all necessary support, we make sure the right things are done so people go back and do business. Ghanaians will definitely get the confidence that they have trusted in us over the years, a chartered banker and a personal investment consultant, Patrick Abankwaba, is of the view that the surviving banks and other financial institutions need to put in strategies to bring back confidence into the system. The few or the monies that are circulating in the, in the economy, most of them are going to the well-established banks that people know of and can trust, whilst the other banks are still struggling to get the few deposits. If the little banks or the smaller banks are not able to get a deposit, what it means is that they cannot also lend to other customers. Barely two years into the financial sector cleanup, some players in the sector think the central bank needs to go beyond the cleanup to make the exercise successful. Well, that's all for the business news segment here on News 360. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Parker Siasari. For more business news stories, you can log on to website www.3news.com. Over to you, Aisha. In some more stories, medical doctor Seth Nani has emphasized early treatment for an elevation in the cholesterol level of an individual's blood to prevent stroke and other associated circulatory concerns. Now, Dr. Seth Nani explained cardiovascular diseases like dyslipidemia, hypertension and diabetes are the number one causes of death globally. Dyslipidemia has to do with an increase in lipids cholesterol or fat levels in the blood. This leads to an increase in the chances of clogged arteries, heart attacks or stroke, especially with persons that smoke. In adults, the situation is mostly associated with unhealthy diets, obesity and lack of exercise. Speaking at a health event organized by Holy Trinity Medical Center in Ghana, which was dubbed Fats That Kill, Understanding Dyslipidemia and Eating Right, Dr. Dennis Botte, 
said the disease can be treated with statins as it blocks HMG enzymes that could lead to the production of cholesterol. Beyond the, even bringing cholesterol down, uh, even to half the levels, we also realized that it has other benefits, um, anti-thrombotic effects that it has, um, the fact that it helps even in other aspects of the person's life, in terms of making sure that the person's, the person's endothelium, or the blood vessel, the lumen, is more stable, and the fact that uh, for those who have plaques already in their lumen of their arteries, the plaques that could give problems. The cholesterol medication actually stabilizes the plaques that they don't break up to form clots. He added that treating patients with dyslipidemia is strictly based on the state of patients in question. A registered dietitian of Holy Trinity, Dr. Nanakofi Owusu, recommended diet and lifestyle changes leading to consumption of unsaturated fat as a means of managing both primary and secondary levels of dyslipidemia. Another thing that we must watch is what we call trans fats. Trans fats basically come about when you overly heat oils. The moment you keep reheating the oil, you realize that the oil's color change to black. And that is high trans fats. And that can raise your blood cholesterol levels and give you dyslipidemia. Research conducted by World Health Organization in 2016 indicates that 17.9 million people died from CVDs, representing 31% of all global deaths. A reminder, you're still watching News 360 Live here from our news hub at Adesewe in Kanda. Accra. If you feel strongly about any of our stories tonight, feel free to share your views and comments with us. Uh, we are very active on social media. Our handle is CB3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. We're going to go for a short break now. When we return, we've got the very latest in international news. We've got sports news as well. You're welcome back. Let's do some entertainment news nine. For most women, operating in a male-dominated industry is often daunting. But newly signed Rock Town Records artist Fantana says she ventured into music to inspire women to believe in themselves and go for gold. She spoke to Naftali Bar. So I like bold songs, songs that have like bold statements in them, especially from women. So for me, when I'm listening to music, I always listen to the lyrics. For me, what I want to do is use my music to empower other women. So I like bold, like bold songs, songs that say things that, you know, on a regular day, a woman wouldn't wake up and say, I want to be able to do. Born Francine Kofi, Fantana is Rocktown Records' latest signee. Barely a month after the release of her debut single, So What? The Afro-pop singer says she is impressed with love shown her by Ghanaians so far. You know, I'm being accepted, I'm being loved, and I feel like it's because I'm being myself. And I'm not, you know, hiding anything, and I'm just being honest about who I am. And I'm not, you know, everything I say is what I actually live by. So. The 22-year-old regrets most female musicians are often stereotyped and judged wrongly, an attitude that stifles creativity and makes it difficult for them to reach their full potentials. She encouraged women to be themselves, dream big and go after their dreams, no matter the challenges posed by society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, giving women a chance to speak their mind and you know, speak what they want to say without being judged, I feel like is what, you know, could really help them. I do see that the men in, the men in Ghana music industry is more than the women. And then I see, I see that the women don't get to like really go to like their full potential. But I feel like we have to, you know, put our foot down and if we really want it, we have to, you know, go for it by any means necessary. Through her music, Fantana, who described herself as a warrior, hopes to empower women to achieve greater heights. Fantana also shared her dreams with TV3 Entertainment. Of course, I want to be one of like the you know biggest musicians in Ghana and in Africa as a whole, and also be recognized outside for being a Ghanaian artist. You know, taking Ghana and Afrobeat to the Western world. Well, that's how we conclude News 360. It came to you live from our studios here at Adisawa in Kanda Accra. Thanks for watching. 
My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. And I am Aisha Yakubu. This morning is on our website. It is 3news.com. Have a good evening.